The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Tonight, if you drive, you're feeling the pinch. Chicago Cubs with the highest gas prices anywhere. Full tank, empty wallet. We go in depth. Illinois lawmakers head home for the summer with no resolution on crucial legislation, from pension reform to same-sex marriage, what this means for taxpayers, legislators, and the governor. Trash talking and hard feelings put aside. Now two feuding Chicago politicians join forces to crack down on the city's most notorious street gang. And a sign of the times as one suburban park district reminds parents it's just a game. These stories and much more tonight on In The Loop. Good evening, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. How can gasoline possibly cost more in Hinsdale than in Honolulu? The Chicago area now has the dubious distinction of being the most expensive place in the country to fill up your tank. And just in time for the summer travel season, gas prices are soaring. According to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas in Chicago is now $4.47. That's 50 cents a gallon higher than Los Angeles, 75 cents more than New York City. Nationally, the average price is $3.61 a gallon. So how are Chicagoans coping and why exactly is gas so incredibly expensive here? I don't have a clue why gas prices are so high here. Chicagoan Marilyn Cooper is a busy working mother, constantly in and out of her car, running around town for her job and driving her kids to school, piano lessons and other activities. It's horrible, honestly. It's, it's really hard, especially when you have children. It's hard to continue to fill up. So many Chicago area drivers, such as Marilyn, who depend on their cars to get around, are feeling the pinch at the pump. For me and the kids, we have to limit ourselves to what we can do because of how far we can travel, just because of the cost of gas. I actually didn't even know how much it was going to be until I saw it right there, and I was floored. 450, I think it's the highest I've ever seen it. Now, the lowest gas prices from News Radio 780. Gas prices have been so high for so long in Chicago that about 10 years ago, WBBM Radio began reporting on where listeners could find the cheapest gas in the area. Everybody was complaining about them, so let's find a way to grasp a hold of something that people care a great deal about. The gas updates have become an hourly feature on the radio station. In Addison, the Speedway at Lake Street and Kinner Avenue, selling gas for 409. So why are Chicago gas prices consistently higher than the rest of the nation? The AAA Chicago Motor Club says the complex answer begins with the simple law of supply and demand. The BP refinery in Whiting, Indiana, is doing a rehab project almost uh, so that it can use the cheap crude oil that's coming down from Canada. Um, and that rehab project hasn't gone as planned. The refinery, one of three in the area, supplies about 460,000 barrels of gas to the Midwest region. But now it is only running at half capacity because of construction delays. So it cannot meet all the demand, and Illinois must ship in more gas from the Gulf region, adding to the cost. On top of that, the federal government mandates a special blend for the summer to improve air quality when smog is at its worst. It's a, just a different blend of gasoline that produces fewer emissions. Uh, it's more expensive to make. Making Chicago gas even more expensive are all those taxes, including state and local sales taxes that are among the highest in the nation. Add them up and they tack more than 80 cents to every gallon of gas in the city of Chicago. Included in that is Illinois' fuel tax, a flat 19 cents per gallon. It hasn't changed in more than 20 years. The head of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce wants to replace it with a percentage tax so that when gas prices go up, the state gets more money to build and repair roads and bridges. The idea is that if you're using the infrastructure of the state, you should be supporting the financing of the maintenance and expansion of that, of that infrastructure. But all those taxes rolled into the price of gas take their toll on those who drive for a living. 
Limo driver Tamir Rafai makes multiple trips to Chicago's airports every day. Right now we're doing rates like $45, same thing as a cab from here to downtown. And with the gas prices nowadays, it's, it's, it's hard. That means limo drivers are likely to pass their fuel costs on to customers. I mean, if it goes up to five, I think we're going to raise up the rates. And this limo driver is cutting back his personal trips as well. I don't go out like I used to be. Like right now, I think twice before I'm like, you know what? If I leave the house, I'm going to spend gas and it's going to cost money. And gas right now is not cheap. So I just stay at the house and wait until I get a pickup or something. And that's when I leave. Illinois is among seven states that charges sales tax on gasoline, and it's the only state allowing counties and municipalities to tack on their own gas taxes. Joining us to help shed more light on these prices are Patrick DeHaan, Senior Petroleum Analyst with GasBuddy.com, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I filled up in downtown Chicago yesterday, <laughs> probably the worst place to fill up in the country. Paid four fifty nine dollars a gallon. I went online and checked Honolulu. It was four twenty five. How is that possible that we're paying more than Hawaii, which is 2,500 miles from the mainland. You know, there's so many factors that go into it. Chicago has the dubious title of having the most expensive parking downtown, and now we have gas prices to boot to go with it. There are a myriad of factors that are driving prices up here in the Great Lakes specifically, and Chicago is going to be one of the worst reasons because of the most specific type of blend of gasoline. The high gasoline taxes in the city and the state are certainly fueling it as well. Uh, and, and then you just have the cost of doing business is certainly going to be much higher in downtown than surrounding communities. All those factors factors right now, including the temporary issues of refineries, are driving prices through the roof hardest hit here in Chicago. But those refineries are right down the road in Indiana, 20 minutes away. Hawaii, they've got to ship oil in tankers. 2,500 miles, that just seems counterintuitive. You know, it, it does. And Hawaii has gasoline taxes that are very high, too. It just goes to show the significance of the problem that we're dealing here uh, with in the Great Lakes uh, and the tightness of gasoline supply and the different blends that refineries are forced to produce. Chicagoland burns something different than the rest of the state, which is something different than uh, some other areas in the country. And supply of all of these types of gasoline is very tight. Why, for example, just one type of gasoline in, in use across the entire state. A little bit more of a, of a simplicity uh, over there than what we're having here. And with these refineries down, it's not just one issue. Uh, we have seen all four of these refineries in Illinois and the one in Northwest Indiana suffering various kinks throughout the springtime. That has resulted in very tight inventories of gasoline. Supply really hasn't been shipped away yet. yet. People are used to these prices. They're still buying enough gas. They're still making trips. That has not reduced reduced demand, uh, and, and, and so that's the problem. We have reduced supply, but demand has remained adequate. But it seems, Patrick, that every summer around Memorial Day, the mm -hmm. start of driving season, inevitably gas prices go up, and I think there's a feeling on, on the part of a lot of motorists that this is some nefarious conspiracy. Oh, and it comes up every spring, and and there may be, a, you could almost call it a conspiracy. It's it's perhaps more obvious than people realize, and a lot of the government regulation uh, that starts on May 1st with the with motorists having to fuel up with these summer gas lanes is causing the pain at the pump. If we didn't have these regulations, we would all be burning the similar type of gasoline. And these are regulations to make the air cleaner. That's right. If everybody, say, for example, used a very stringent type of gasoline, what we use in Chicago, Chicago uh, could be used elsewhere, and what's used in the Gulf Coast could be sent to us immediately, and what's used on the East Coast or in other cities, you know, it's, it would all be interchangeable, and supply of, of just this one type of gasoline would be adequate, but instead refineries are forced to produce about five different types, supply of them is very low, and if a refinery in, in Detroit, for example, goes down, they can't produce enough gasoline for Detroit, then Chicagoland refineries are forced to then produce what Detroit needs, and, and therefore Chicago supply of Chicago gasoline then takes a hit, prices are going up everywhere. So if we had one regulation, it certainly would be much easier for refineries. The other big part of Chicago taxes, as we mentioned before, mm -hmm. is taxes. Let's take a, a look at the breakdown of how much tax we pay on a gallon of gasoline. And in the city of Chicago, you're paying more than 80 cents when you add up all these taxes. The county and city take 23 cents, the state 42 cents, federal uh, 18 cents. And I guess what makes Chicago unusual is that the city and county not only 
<laughs> charge a fuel tax. They also charge sales taxes. And I don't think there are many other cities that get that in the country. No, it's very rare. Taxation uh, you know, varies extremely with, with gasoline, but it is one of those rare instances where uh, motorists, I'm most, in my opinion, kind of double charged here by different forms of government. As you said, you have the feds, which haven't really touched the federal gasoline tax in uh, over two decades. That's 18 cents. That, that's right, 18.4. That's right. Every state, 18.4 cents goes to the feds. Then the states have various taxes, gasoline that's 19 taxation. 19 cents in Illinois. That's right. And then you have a percentage-based tax, which, of course, fluctuates with the price of gasoline. The higher the price of crude, the higher the wholesale cost of gasoline, the higher the taxation. So that's an, a, a factor that you have to think about, too, with the higher cost. Prices go up a little bit more exponentially than they do when taxes are just a flat per gallon charge. So unfortunately, we have to deal with that. And then motorists, like you indicate, uh, the municipality, the city, the county, you know, different taxes Everybody at different gets levels. A cut. That's right. Everybody wants a cut. And we are hearing more and more about more domestic production gas mm -hmm. here in the United States and North Dakota, the tar sands from Canada. Why aren't we seeing this North American oil production reflected in the price of gas? Well, that's the craziest thing about this all is, is last week the EIA reported that oil this inventories... This is the Energy Information Association. That's right. Uh, just reported that oil inventories hit a new all-time record high. Records were, were started uh, to be kept in 1978. So we're talking about uh, just massive amounts of oil. The problem in this country remains with the refineries that we rely on to take that crude oil, run it through their plants, and turn it into desirable, pro desirable products. And that has been the entire bottleneck here. We can have as much oil uh, as anybody in the world. We can have a stockpile that could last us years. But if there's nobody to refine it or a limited ability to do so, prices for that fin uh, the fin uh, finished product are certainly going to be much higher. And that's what we're dealing with. All right, Patrick, thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate it very much. Some of that gas tax money helps pay for the gigantic Illinois pension debt you've been hearing so much about. And, of course, the pension crisis, $100 billion and counting, is only one of many critical issues Illinois legislators failed to deal with during their disaster of a spring session. And here's Barbara with more. The cost to fund the pension crisis is rising by $17 million every day while our state's credit rating has taken another hit. And Chicagoans we spoke with are disgusted. The legislature was elected to represent what the people want and they don't seem to be doing that. You know, they're, they're working on their own agenda. They're not taking care of the issues that matter. And pension reform is one of the biggest and it's just gone by the wayside. It's unfortunate that legislature can't come to get can't come together and make a decision on how the funds should be managed in a timely manner. And then they need to take their personal views out of things and just look at the issue at hand. And then I think we would probably come to some type of agreement because it's really not about them. It's about the people. And when I read in the headlines that the day ended without uh, any agreement whatsoever, I was shocked. And we have a state that's going to have to deal with uh, bankruptcy issues and loss of credit, which is already in the already known uh, reputation far and wide. I talk to people in New York, and they can't believe what's going on. Comparable state would be California, which had also terrible budget problems, but they've solved their problems. Why can't our state do the same? I mean, as far as uh, the same-sex marriage, you know, that something that probably should have been voted on. I don't know if they had enough votes for it to pass, but, uh, you know, whether it's passed now or, you know, next session, it's something that should be done. Kind of make you want to leave, <laughs> but uh, you got a lot of roots here, young kid and stuff. You don't want to kind of snatch your family around. So I just hope that um, they'll get it together. Some strong words and strong opinions from the public and now perhaps from our panel. Joining me tonight are Robert Starks, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Northeastern Illinois University, Mike Terson, Public Relations and Marketing Manager and former public address announcer for the Chicago Cubs and Wolves, and Gaynor Hall, reporter for WGN-TV and anchor for CLTV. Welcome to you all. Now, state lawmakers have left Springfield, their home on summer vacation, without solving the state's most pressing problem, that $100 billion pension crisis. Bob, how angry should taxpayers be? Well, taxpayers should be very angry, and I'm personally angry. I retired last May because 
of the warning that uh, the pension problem was going to get worse. So I think I got out before <laughs> the, the, the crisis really hit. But I think at some point, the legislators are going to have to put aside their personal um, <clears throat> beliefs and work on this problem and solve it. It's their problem because they did not put the money in the, in the system. The workers, professors like myself, we always put our money in automatically, but the, and the state legislature did not put its money in. It That's just, the problem. It just feels like we've been talking about this issue forever. We have. Yeah. Lawmakers <laughs> have to get years. something yeah. done on this. And I think what we're going to see is Governor Quinn is going to call them back this summer because uh, not only are the taxpayers losing, but his political future is in jeopardy. Precisely. This is Precisely. great fodder mm -hmm. for all of the, the, the mm -hmm. Rawners and uh, the Dailies who are lining up Rutherford. wanting a chance to move into the governor's mansion. Yeah. Well, the question is, can he afford to do this? He called them back last summer for pension reform. Nothing got done. Can he afford to do this twice? As you say, his political capital may be slipping away. Mm -hmm. We saw Bruce Rauner join the race yesterday looking for the Republican nod for governor. Bill Daley, son of one Chicago mayor, brother of another, is also contemplating a run. He called this dysfunctional, a debacle, and he called Governor Quinn out for his failure to lead. He even uh, made fun of the illustration that Governor Quinn used to talk about this pension battle, Squeezy the Python. Take a look. The problem is the squeeze. You see, as government employers try to keep up payments into the pension fund, they have to slash other services that we need, like schools, for example. Mr. Daly said Squeezy the Python hasn't really squeezed anyone. Mike, how vulnerable do you think the governor is? Very. Uh, I think that uh, this falls on leadership in both the House and the Senate as well. Um, but I think that the governor is very vulnerable. Um, I think this is an opportunity. I think the Republicans have uh, had their issues in previous elections, and this is an opportunity for them to get it together and uh, affect some change and get their message out there. Bob, can he win another term if he doesn't get a pension deal? I do not think he can. Not only that, he has a problem of casinos on his, in the city of Chicago and just all kinds of issues. I think Lisa Madigan is breathing down his back very, very hard, and that's going to be a real serious uh, debacle for him. It's going to be interesting to see if Lisa Madigan jumps in the race and, uh, <laughs> you know, Bill Daly hasn't said which way he's going to go. Right. We'll know within uh, a week, he right. said. But his decision will have something to do with whatever uh, Lisa Madigan decides, precisely, for sure. Precisely. Um, adding to the, the governor's worries, I mean, this has not been a good week for him at all not and not a good all. session for him. But even in his ability to try to convene leaders to get a meeting going to decide whether he should call a special session, he couldn't get a hold of Mike Madigan. Uh, he was forced to leave a message with Mike Madigan's wife mm -hmm. because Mr. Madigan does not have a cell phone. <laughs> Mike, is this any way to run a state government? Well, I don't think so. Uh, that's, uh, what, what can you say about that? I mean, that's, if you can't communicate, if you can't talk about it, how are you going to solve the problem? And Bob made a good point, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really have to put their egos aside. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's a big part of this. It's a big part of it. And it's all looking for, toward the election. I think all of the people involved are really looking, trying to see how the lack of a pension sol uh, solving can affect their, their uh, uh, re-election. Well, another measure that got a lot of talk in the legislative session there was a promised vote, and then at the end, nothing. Same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, Gaynor, how big of a misstep is this for Illinois? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I think what we saw was the clergy, the religious leaders, mm -hmm. uh, really flexing their muscle on this. People in the LGBT community, though, were stunned because they really thought uh, that the votes were going to be there. And then we come up and there's no vote. I mean, it was really a stunning mm -hmm. uh, lack of action. But I think for sure that throughout this summer, that push is going to continue to get something done on this issue. But please remember now, you have the Cardinal who put together uh, a, a group of clergy from the Baptist, the black uh, uh, ministers, and they 
lobbied very hard. So many of the legislators are really deathly afraid of the ministerial committees that is opposing this. I don't think that religion should play a part in it at all. Uh, I think that's the big problem here. Um, I compare it to uh, in the 1960s with interracial marriage. Uh, some of these issues are exactly the same. Uh, there's a separation of church and state. And when you tell people they have legal rights in this country, you can't just give it to a certain group of people. And I think that the, uh, the people who are outraged that this didn't get called to a vote have a very valid point. The sponsor of the bill, Greg Harris, is going to be working very hard uh, to push those folks who are on the fence over to the yes side of the issue because they really have mobilized, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the clergy and religious leaders, they really have mobilized uh, on this particular issue in a strong way. Please keep in mind that Illinois is one of the, the most uh, populous Catholic states in the country, right? And they, many, many people really follow the lead of the cardinal. And when he said he's, he, it's, a, it's a sin and it's not going to go, they follow that. So, and many legislators are also following the lead of the cardinal and, and those other ministers. And even, the, I mean, we had uh, President Obama was here right before that vote was taken, or the vote didn't happen, right, rather, calling for, um, calling for passage of it. Uh, you had Mark Kirk, mm -hmm. the highest ranking Republican, coming out in favor of same-sex marriage. So it, it's, it's really interesting how this is playing out right now. now. Speaking of Mark Kirk, uh, he uh, is joining forces after an inflammatory exchange with Representative Bobby Rush. Uh, Mark Kirk had asked for a roundup, in essence, of the gangster disciples incarcerating about 18,000 people as a solution to dealing with the most notorious Chicago street gang. Uh, Representative Rush then called it an upper middle class elitist white boy solution to a problem he knows nothing about. Um, it's basically saying that maybe a poor choice of words, but more arrests are not the answer. This week they have gotten together and decided to pledge, join forces, and take on this gang, uh, I think go ahead. I Mike. think it's great that they join forces and they're not having these war of words, so to speak. But, you know, the fact that Congressman Rush said what he said, I don't think you could ignore that. Uh, I think it was a very racist thing to say. Um, if, if Senator Kirk had said something similar, we'd be having an entirely different conversation about that. And I, and I don't think that that's fair. The problem is uh, Bobby Rush is making very valid and critical points. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, the message is lost in the incendiary language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You can't just round up 18,000 people and send them to jail. It has to be a more comprehensive approach, um, and incarceration is not the answer, absolutely. not the only absolutely. answer, but the problem is the words but that he used. Absolutely, yeah. and you know, when you are a leader of whether you're a leader in your community or you're in Congress or whatever your role is, um, I, I think it is upon you to try and uh, solve the problem and not defend, come to the defense of, of a, a known criminal group. Uh, I would have liked to have seen Congressman Rush uh, take a little bit of a different position on that. Bob, well, you've got something well, to say. Let's, go, let's ahead. go back on this. The, many of the people I talk to say that the GDs or the gangster disciples, whatever, is not really active at the moment. There are remnants of them, but most of the shootings and the, the drug trafficking is done by independent youngsters rather than a gang. So, and then secondly, as as Gaynor pointed out, where are you going to put 18,000 people? There's no jail in the state that can hold 18,000. Secondly, African-American young men are constantly complaining about the fact that they are picked up routinely and with, you know, without any real reason uh, under Illinois' stop and frisk, which is not on the books like it is in New York, but it happens. So I think it's very indiscriminate. I like what Bobby Rush said. I, his choice of language could have been different. 
but he's right on the money. I All think right. that one, one more quick point here we'll make. There's mm -hmm. a, in Buffalo Grove, and you've had a part in this, Mike. Mm -hmm. They put up signs basically that say, this is just a game uh, asking parents to behave themselves better at their children's games, uh, that basically uh, ask parents to uh, say it's highly unlikely that college recruiters or scouts are watching the games. It's about having fun. Is it sad that this is necessary, Mike? It, it is a, a little bit. I'll admit that. I crafted the sign. Um, <laughs> You know, when I was the public address announcer for the Cubs and the Wolves, more so with the Cubs, though, you would see a lot of bad fan behavior. And I think that that bad fan behavior, uh, we have conditioned people in our society that this is how you behave at sporting events. And it is definitely trickling down into our communities and our youth sporting events. Uh, people berate umpires and officials. Uh, they yell at coaches. Coaches yell at each other. I mean, it, it's just bad behavior. Um, so. Personally, I thought that rather than uh, trying to uh, tell people uh, in plain English what, how to behave, uh, if we could come up with a way to publicize it creatively, maybe put a little humor in it, uh, we might uh, have some better results. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. We'd so love to discuss this <laughs> further. But Robert Starks, Mike Turson, thank Gaynor you. Hall, thank you. thank you for joining us today. Yeah. We see them every day, plants, animals, insects, and various bird species. While you might think Brookfield Zoo or Lincoln Park Zoo would have the most biodiversity in the city, think again. WBEZ uncovers the surprising answer in this week's Curious City. Hi, I'm Jennifer Brandel with WBEZ's Curious City. And Aaron Dernbaugh asked us, what part of Chicago has the most biodiversity? Translation, where in the city can you find the most species of animals, plants, and insects? Our search lands us in the far southeast side of Chicago, the Calumet region. And specifically, we go to Powderhorn Prairie and Marsh. It's a 190-acre Cook County Forest Preserve that strangely sits among big tracts of industrial land. It's even right next to a railroad track. But don't let this industrial scenery fool you. One of the reasons Powderhorn is so diverse is because of its dune and swale topography. A dune and swale environment looks like a bunch of small ridges. Picture corrugated cardboard. The sand dunes were caused by Lake Michigan's shore gradually receding a long time ago. While the valley of the dunes is a wet, swampy kind of habitat, the top is a dry, more prairie-like habitat. This makes it a prime spot for lots of different plants and animals with varying needs. There are your usual suspects like chipmunks and squirrels, white-tailed deer, raccoons, possum. But then, if you're really lucky, you might get to see a pocket gopher. Then there are plants like sedges, swamp verbena, nodding wild onions, cattails, milkweed, wild white indigo, and get this, cacti. We can't be 100% sure that this is the most biologically diverse spot in the city, but still, it represents the diversity and the richness of the biology of our region, even in an urban environment. Now, it's up to you to go out and enjoy it. That does it for this week. You are now in the loop. The conversation continues right now at WYCC.org. Until next week, good night.